All right, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of Coromanti instrumental music there, courtesy of the Granny Nanny Cultural Group. What a better way. Somebody said, I heard an abeng. I'll confirm that, Carl Whittingham. With our guest this evening, ladies and gentlemen, who I am proud to introduce to you, um, uh, Professor Dr. Harcourt Fuller. And just a little bit about Dr. Fuller here. Um, he, uh, Dr. Harcourt Fuller is a Fulbright Global Scholar, Whiting Public Humanities Fellow, and Associate Professor of History in the Department of History at Georgia State University. He holds a PhD in International History and an MSc with Merit in History of International Relations from the London School of Economics, LSE, in addition to a Bachelor of Arts in International Studies and a Master of Arts in History from the City University of New York. He has previously taught at Connecticut College, Emmanuel College, Florida International University, and was a visiting researcher at the African Studies Center and a visiting scholar in the African American Studies program at Boston University. As an internationally recognized scholar, Dr. Fuller has conducted research, given invited lectures, and presented conference papers in Africa, Europe, North and South America, and the Caribbean. Dr. Fuller's multidisciplinary research and teaching expertise include the socio-political, cultural, and economic history of West Africa, Ghana in particular, and the African diaspora in the Americas, particularly Jamaica, Peru, and Ecuador. His scholarship focuses on the history of resistance against slavery and colonialism, particularly through marinage, as well as anti-colonial nat nationalism, transitionalism, symbolic nationalism, and the construction of national and ethno-national identity in the African world. Okay, Dr. Fuller is a member of the Winward Jamaica Maroon community, and he resides right here in our community in the ATL. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fuller. Dr. Fuller, good evening and welcome to the Wayne All Show. Good evening, uh, Wayne. Blessings to you, um, respect, um, and um, greetings to all of your listeners all over the world. Thank you so much for making the time to be here with us this evening. It is truly, truly appreciated, Dr. Fuller. And um, as we get into this discussion this evening, I want to set the tone by saying I reached out more about a desire to learn okay. than even to stoke any kind of controversy or anything, you know, to, to do with the topic as it is right now. I want to learn and I would like my audience to learn. And I felt you'd be a great resource. I have seen the clips of you on other platforms helping to teach and educate and help us connect the dots with our heritage there in Jamaica. So I'm really grateful that you could do that for the, us tonight. Um, what I would like to start by asking, and feel free to steer this from your um, rich, um, knowledgeable, and, and just the advantage of being on this subject so often, you feel free to even steer this in terms of how best we can <coughs> deliver on it. As I said, it's a matter of learning tonight. But, you know, we're hearing a lot in the news lately about the maroon situation in Jamaica, and a lot of us are trying to understand it. We go to source A, and we hear, oh, there was a treaty some years ago. Then we go to source B, and oh, that treaty doesn't exist anymore. It's not valid. And so, thank you, man. How can we process all this? On what historical basis? can we begin to process what's happening now with our Maroons in Jamaica? Well, thanks for the question. And um, uh, first of all, as a matter of um, <clears throat> how we usually begin, I, I wanna draw your attention, you know, to the Abeng, uh, because you, I think you said someone said they heard Yes, Abeng. yes. I cannot see myself on the screen, but can you see Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The audience is seeing the Abeng right now. All right. So first of all, let me say that the Abeng is a side-blown cow's horn. Um, in Jamaica, it's a cow's horn. I'll talk about West Africa in a second. And this is um, 
a signaling horn that our ancestors used um, hundreds of years ago and today. But yes, when we're talking about the historical period um, from the 16th, 17th, um, and uh, 18th and 19th century, right? Yes. Um, basically, they, they used this during that period uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a war horn to, for example, when the, let's say, when the British Redcoats were fighting uh, the Maroons up in the mountains, they, the Maroons would blow this to let other Maroons know when to attack, when to retreat, um, where the, the true movements are, etc. Also, um, it's a musical instrument. And so the track that you played, um, which is an instrumental, it starts with the Maroons. I'm sorry, it starts with the Abeng, right? Yeah. And so we always start anything with the blowing of the Abeng okay. as, as a sign of welcoming the ancestors into this uh, space. Yes. And I, I wanna say uh, a big up, if I may, to the uh, more tone Granny Nanny cultural group. The track that you just played is from their album, Granny Nanny Como, which I executive produced. And uh, as you know, Wayne, because you introduced them in 2016, when they appeared, uh, they were in Atlanta and they performed uh, on a number of stages, uh, for example, at the Atlanta, uh, the Grace Atlanta Jerk Festival. Yes, I recall. Um, the final thing I wanna say about the Abeng, in the spirit of what you said that we are here to learn and I'm here to try my best to facilitate that, is that the Abeng, the, act, the word Abeng, uh, a variation of it comes from the Akan, Cree language that is spoken by Akan people such as the Ashanti that are found mainly in Ghana, but also in Cote d'Ivoire or the Ivory Coast. All right, and it's the same word that they use. And it essentially it's, a, it's an animal horn, which is used as a, uh, for, as a signaling horn and as a musical instrument that made its way to Jamaica and to other places where you have Maroon peoples. So that's the first lesson of the night. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Are you going to blow it? Um, the abeng is usually blown by specialists, right? Oh, so okay. there is, a, and it's a, it's a, it's an excellent question. And and as I talk, you're going to hear things that really help explain what the maroons are, or who the maroons are, essentially. So the maroons, um, we have a, a connection to our ancestors, right? And for yeah. people who really Sometimes when people hear the word ancestors, it might mean something different. So let me tell you who, when I say ancestors, you're, you're the people who were physically here, I know they have gone to the, the other world, if, if I may, right? Yes. So whether that's your grandparents, great grandparents, great, great, or others. So that word shouldn't be spooky to people because I know sometimes people say, oh, uh, the PR certain things. No, these are the people who, without whom you and I wouldn't be here. So we, so we, so we use the abeng to bring them into um, this, this um, space. Um, so that's essentially, um, you know, what, 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 what that is. Well, you know what? I am so happy I played that first. <laughs> wow. What yeah. a divine coincidence. Absolutely. I play that first just because it's a great, I like the 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 the, the medley. And I yeah. figured this is a nice yeah. intro, not realizing yeah. the abeng that's blown at the start of the song would symbolically be a great way to have started this conversation. Yes, I know so we're on the right track. Blow the abeng. Um, yes. Because the abeng, when you blow it, you send a, a specific message. Nowadays, for example, if someone in the mountains is lost or someone drones or if there is a, a natural disaster like an earthquake uh, you have the 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 specialists who can blow and they send a signal that people will understand within the community um right. so it's still used for those types of emergency um reasons awesome very good yeah, yeah. okay yeah okay thanks for that thanks for that so Absolutely. now you know yeah. um I, I had asked, and if you so think it's, per, you know, it makes sense for us to start there. J just help us understand the, the maroon, their history, and the current yeah. situation um, All right. in Jamaica. So, so the word maroon, let's start with that. Um, and this is where, this is why 
doing research and constantly doing research really, really makes sense because what you know now may change later with new information. So let's start with the word. It's generally accepted within the academic community that the word maroon comes from the Spanish word cimarron. Oh. Okay, cimarron. Okay, C-I-M-A-R-R-O-N, cimarron. And, and cimarron is, is a term that was used initially in, in Hispaniola, where you have the Dominican Republic and, and Haiti on that island. And then it was used in other contexts like in Jamaica. And it's generally meant, it was used by the Spaniards to refer to wild cattle um, or wild pigs that had run away up into the mountains. And so, they, so usually the term was, was seen as meaning wild and untamed. However, um, more recent research actually ties the word not to, this, not to the Spanish language, but to uh, an Arawak word, right? The Arawak language spoken by the Taino people. And it's essentially um, means an arrow in that in flight. So, you know, when an arrow is in flight and it's kind of gone out of sight, it's gone to, you know, a far place. Yes. The so Maroons are people who, to use a Jamaican terminology, take with themselves from the plantations on the coastal areas generally, and they, they find the far furthest place away from slavery that they can find, that they could have, have found. Okay. And usually the first Maroons were actually mm -hmm. not Africans, but the indigenous people of whichever land we're talking about. And so Maroons are not just found in Jamaica. Maroons are found essentially everywhere that you had slavery, you had bands of people who ran away. Now, because they were usually hunted down, captured and killed, um, not, uh, is not all the communities that, that started in the 16th century uh, that have survived today. And so you have Maroons, for example, in Brazil, and their communities are called Quilombos. You have Maroons in the Spanish speaking countries like Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Cuba, and those communities are called Palenques, okay? And then you have um, Maroons mm. in places like Haiti and the French speaking colonies um, who, are, who are referred to as Negmahon, all right? Um, you have Maroons in places like Suriname, French Guyana, British Guyana, using those terms, um, and Barbados, Grenada, and of course, uh, Jamaica. So that's the first thing I want people to understand. And when we talk about Maroons, the first Maroons were usually the first indigenous people who ran away. And then as more and more African slaves were brought into these spaces, uh, and forgive me, I also, I, I forgot to mention the United States uh, had a Maroons. For example, in the Great Dismal Swamp, which is mm. an area between North Carolina and Virginia, that yes. swamp um, um, had Maroons for over 220 years. Um, in Florida, and I know many of your listeners are going to be in Florida, the, the people known as Seminoles, okay? And if you listen to the word Seminole, it sounds like Cimarron, Cimarron, Seminole, Seminole. Maroon. Yes. And you have indigenous Mar um, Seminoles and, and, and black Seminoles. So in, even in the United States, you have people who are Maroons um, that, you know, um, for hundreds of years, right? So Maroons are all over. We have different names and different terminologies in different places. And usually the communities emerge out of the indigenous people who ran away and went into the mountains and then the African peoples join them later. Specifically in the case of Jamaica, that's what happened. The Taino people who were colonized by the Spanish who occupied Jamaica roughly from around 1509 to 1655, they were the first people to run away or to escape from the plantations and head up to the the cockpit country, which is, you know, what we're talking about in the western part of Jamaica, as well as the Blue and Jonquil Mountains in the eastern parishes of, um, you know, St. Thomas, Portland, St. You know, Mary, et cetera, et cetera, um, right? And, and, and also in Clarendon, in other, St. Catherine, other places. 
And so that is the genesis of the Maroon community in Jamaica. The Taino people who were later joined by uh, waves of Africans who formed a union in the mountains and became what most people know, know as um, Maroons, um, although we have other names that we call ourselves as well. Okay. And the key, a very key word you're using there is indigenous. And mm -hmm. um, Taino, um, if I'm correct, was, were those like the Indians, um, Amerindians? Are those yes, the same? That would, yes, yeah, they're, yeah. yeah, those terms, yeah, we use in indigenous. But yes, they, they are the first, uh, first peoples, right? The right. First Nation people, as they, in Canada, they refer to as their, fir their indigenous people as First Nation pe nations, right? So yeah. they, these are the first inhabitants of Jamaica, yes. Okay, great. And so um, it, I'm hearing here that, these indigenous folks, first inhabitants, as you said, took with themselves from the mm -hmm. mainland. So the, down, you know, up to the mountains in different areas around the country. Yes. And then as African slaves, um, Africans who were brought as slaves mm -hmm. found ways away from the slavery, away from the locations, they made it to these maroons in the, in the hills or locations where they were. And there was a blending of people, huh? There's a coming yes. together. Yes, and how do we know that? There's a number of, of things. So let's start with, you know, among Maroon people. Um, yes. And, you know, um, even within our families, sometimes there are descriptions of uncle so-and-so have straight black hair. Our uncles are so-and-so. There are phenotypical physical yeah. features that even within our community, we have always described this merger of the indigenous, the, the Taino, and the Maroons, right? Just without any research, yes. right? And then, and then also, there are other things uh, as well that we talk about. Um, but mm -hmm. from a scholarly standpoint, yes, um, uh, the there have been archaeological and specifically his, um, um, done by historical archaeologists who have gone up to places like Old Nanny Town, which is where Queen Nanny. Uh, you know, had her stronghold. And right. they, 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 the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, which is, which is a, um, a, a government body in Jamaica that does yes. research on the archaeology and the history of Jamaica, they have found material remains of the Taino people um, in the mountains. And, and the evidence shows that they had a a, a, a union, if you will, with the Africans who, who came as well. And then also, as um, I have done genetic research, meaning that I've used DNA, working with a, a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Jada Ben Torres from Vanderbilt University, who is a molecular anthropologist. And we have done DNA research in a compound and Moortown. And we have found evidence that suggests this this connection between the, the Tainos and the Africans. Um, wow. Yeah. wow. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Harcourt Fuller, professor of history at, the, uh, at Georgia State. And, and I, I need to add a little bit of information that I did not share when he came on originally. He's, he's a historical consultant and on-screen commentator for the Smithsonian Channel series, which is airing every Monday during Black History Month. So you can find more of this great information there with Dr. Fuller. Dr. Fuller, I wanna not just talk, I wanna play a little bit of this music you've shared with me. I would yeah. like to play the Granny Come On, the Granny Nanny called from the, the Granny Not, the Granny Nanny Come Ho song. Yes, yes, and absolutely. Then and then we're going to get back to talking because I want to hear more when we come back about how that coming together and how history and the battles fought has shaped um, the, 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 the history of the Maroons in Jamaica. So okay. let's, let's play from the Granny Nanny cultural group, ladies and gentlemen, Granny Nanny, come home, come home. Granny nanny 
kama ya ye ya nini gani nani kama ya ye ya nini ya benga la bengwa ya ye ya nini kama ni robani ya ye ya nini ya benga la bengwa ya ye ya nini gani nani kama ya ye ya nini gani nani kama ya ye ya nini ya kopa na boy ya ye So ladies and gentlemen, again, we're talking with Dr. Arcord Fuller, Professor of History at the U Georgia State University. We're talking a little bit about our own history in Jamaica, though, the Maroons and in the current climate of what's going on there, so we can have a better perspective of what's going on. I want to say good evening to Mr. Garfield McCook, the founder and the president of the JIIFSC, and we have their latest information later on on the show before we get out of here tonight. Maxine Lyons, you say you're very proud of Dr. Fuller. You know him as Prof. Awesome. Big up, Maxine. <laughs> <laughs> Nadine yeah, Ellis says, yes, informative indeed. Maxine says it's very informative. And someone actually says, uh, Wayne Hall, this is the beauty of your platform, always educational. Well, thank you. And Lorna Beck in Charleston, South Carolina, says hello. Uh, and Mr. Whittingham, you were mm -hmm. right. It was an abeng that you heard, sir. Dr. Fuller, yes. help us now that we've understand the origins of the Maroons, how they got to be where they are, who they were made up of. Help us understand now as we went through the wars and to the point where the state at the time had to pay special attention to the Maroons as a people. Okay. All right. And if, if you will permit me, I, I have to say a couple of other quick things. The track you just played is from this album. It's a double CD MP3 album. Um, and the way how Maroons, or how we record our, our history, yes. is through the drums, the abeng, oral history, and our songs. And that is very important for what I'm going to say uh, next. Because who records history and how it is recorded is one of the reasons why we have some of the misunderstandings that we have yes. right now. Yes, All right, yes. so I just, if I, if I may, I want to big up the Granny Nanny Cultural Group again. Major Charles Aaron, the leader, the elder, um, Hope, you know, Juki, Baga, Aaron, all of these people. This type of music needs to be encouraged because quite frankly, it is a, I would say it is an endangered art uh, in Jamaica. Right, because as the elders join the ancestors, and quite frankly, many young people uh, leave the Maroon communities uh, or the country of Jamaica, it's difficult to find people who know how, who understand the culture or language or music, etc. And so, if I may, I would encourage all of you to support this project because this helps in the preservation of the Maroon way of life, which is also the Jamaican way of life, which we will address as well. This is available on all digital platforms. The album is called Granny Nanny Como by the Granny Nanny um, Cultural Group. 
All right, so uh, please. All right, so let's talk about uh, warfare because this is very important. The, um, the Maroon people have been fighting for their existence and their survival from the Spanish period, right? So I, I had mentioned before that the Spanish occupied Jamaica roughly from around 1509 to 1655, yes. which is over, uh, if you do the maths, 100 and what, uh, you, know, you know, almost 150 years, 150 years. And so there were different bands of, of, of Maroons uh, fighting the Maroons, but the, the, the fighting the Spanish. But the, the Spanish never really had a stronghold on Jamaica because it wasn't one of their major um, colonies and, and, and they didn't have a lot of Spaniards there. But when the British invaded the island and, and, and essentially took it over from 1655, they had a couple of years warfare with the uh, Spanish. And yeah. in, in the middle of this warfare, more and more enslaved Africans ran away to the mountains and joined the bands of, of Maroons. So over the decades, more and more Maroons, uh, more and more enslaved Africans ran away and joined with the Maroons and they kept fighting. And the Maroons, because they knew the, as they say, the hills and valleys and, and, and the rivers and, and all of these things, they actually had the advantage because many of them came to Jamaica with what with uh, military skills from West Africa, and so when the British went up into the mountains, and they are they have on them bright red coats and they are used to marching in a certain way and fighting in a traditional way, the Maroons would ambush them, would would because Maroons also had weapons, they had guns that they had captured from the British, and also they had traded for and so they would you know fire at the british you know move and frustrate them and beat them in in essentially every battle wow right yes and and so the british from 1655 to to 1738 which is over 80 years over eight decades the maroons were fighting the british no the the british did everything to try to um to try to conquer the Maroons. One, the first thing they do, they did, which was a divide and rule strategy, which is very important. They offered their enslaved people, everything from money to clothing, to more opportunities. Okay, I will let you go see your wife on the next plantation, or I will not beat your child that much if you come help us hunt down the Maroons or if you go spy on the Maroons, okay? Or I will give you your freedom if you help us to track down and spy on the Maroons. And so the British formed a regiment which is called the Black Shots. And the Black Shots were made up of enslaved Africans and free people of color. Now, what people need to understand is that there were Black people during slavery who actually had their freedom for a variety of reasons. Um, many of them were usually mixed race people, mulattoes as they were called, right? And so these free black people, as well as enslaved people were formed into these black shots and yes. they would go after the Maroons. Mm -hmm. the, the British also brought canine dogs from places, uh, for, for canine dogs into the country to hunt the Maroons. Right. And yeah. then the British brought uh, a set of people known as the Mosquito Indians, that's the historical terms, from Central America, places like Honduras and them place, brought them into the country to go and fight against the Maroons. They even brought Native Americans from the United States to fight against the Maroons. So again, they used different people to go after the Maroons, but they, they could not defeat the Maroons you, because you had skilled um, leaders like Kojo and a Kompong and Queen Nani and Kwau, et cetera, and they couldn't beat yeah. them. Yeah. And so finally the British, because they wanted to continue their, their enslavement and their sugar plantations, et cetera, they were forced to, 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 to approach the Maroons to, to sign a peace treaty. Um, in, Jamaica, in, 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 in normal Jamaican parlance, we, we would say that as, as my, my, my good friend, Professor Varian Shepherd always says, that the British them cry, cree, 
<laughs> so them cry Cree. The British cry Cree. Them the cry Cree, Cree and them come and they, they ask for peace. Now here's the other context. The Maroons, and, and you know, sometimes uh, this is something that's contentious, right? And I'm getting to the treaty. Yes. All right? The Maroons were, were illiterate in the European language, in English. How do we know that? Anytime someone signs their name in an X, it means they are they cannot read that language. And so the treaties were, were, were uh, drafted by the British in the English language with all of the legal terms and all of that kind of stuff. And it was written from a British perspective. Yes. All right. And so the Maroons did, some Maroons, let me clarify that, did did sign on to that because there was a fierce debate within the Maroon community among the leadership as to whether or not to sign a treaty with the British. Think about your, you, your people has, ha, have been at war for almost nine decades, 80 odd years. The Maroons, even though they were winning battles, they still had to run up and down you know, the mountains, their, their villages were burnt and destroyed. And whenever they got caught by the red coats, the militia and the black shots, they would be um, killed and tortured. Okay. So people, I, 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 would, I would ask people to understand that when you've been fighting for so long and you, you have a chance for peace, some of the Maroon leaders decided that was the best time. And anyone who studies military history know that you may, you, 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 you make peace when you have the upper hand. Because it is my contention that had the Maroons continued to fight, the British would have been able to get more reinforcements from other um, slave colonies, um, from Britain um, itself, and from some of Brit Britain's um, allies in, in Europe, etc. And so the Maroons decided to, to make, uh, um, uh, to have this treaty. Now, Queen Nani uh, of the Maroons, who came from the western, the eastern part of Jamaica, from Portland, right? Yeah. Well, yes. of course, she was from Ghana, but that's where she 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 was based up in um, Portland, in the Blue Mountains. She advised against signing the treaty because she, quite frankly, hated the British for what they were doing to 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 uh, her people and to 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 the to uh, other people. And she wanted to continue the fight, but there was a split, and some decided to sign the treaty. And uh, in a sense, Nani was overruled, and so we have two treaties: one um, signed um, um, in um, on by the Leeward Maroons under Kojo, and one signed by the Winwan Maroons under Kwao. But right. I want to emphasize again that it was a difficult decision whether to make peace or to continue war because there would be consequences either way. Wow. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. It sounded like it became a battle of attrition that it, it, it really should. It, it, it made sense for the Maroons not to get have their stamina and, and, and war-like, you know, resources exposed you know eventually by the british who had the money and the manpower to just keep coming at them so you're saying these documents these the 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 um peace treaty were in in fact kind of signed under a little bit of duress or would that be too strong a word i think that leaders made a decision that it was in their best interest to have peace. Okay. Now the treaty, one of the content, let's get the contentious things out the way. The yeah. treaty, one of the things it says is that Maroons were compelled to return slave, enslaved people and to put down any further rebellions in the country. And also if Britain was attacked, let's say by Spain or any other foreign power, the Maroons would help them to yeah. put that down. Okay. Uh, and that is something that has caused a lot of contention. Uh, it's one of the most contentious issues today because people say, well, are the Maroon them sell out them fellow black brother and sister, right? And that is something that uh, is understandable that if you, if you sign a treaty that you have to return other enslaved people, you know, it's understandable that people would see that as problematic. And, and, I, and, I, and I think it is. However, 
let me provide the other context. You know, I think one of the things sometimes people talk about black people as 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 we as as if we are a, a monolithic group. We are just one thing. And remember that we even in Africa, you had different ethnic groups. What yeah. some people use tribes. the word tribes, right? Yes. You have the Yoruba, you have the Fulani, you have the Ekwe, you have the Ga, you have the Fanti, you have all these different people. And just like any other people in the world, Europeans, uh, Asians, other, they also had their 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 warfare because they're human beings. And so in Jamaica, the Maroons, by the time you get to the, the signing of the treaties in 1738 into 1739, the Maroons had become a nation within ourselves. We had our own territories. We, we, we were the ones who retained more of the, the African languages, which is essentially a country spoken by the Ashanti, for example, and other Akan peoples. We had our own chiefs. We were different in a sense. And I know that might be difficult for people to swallow because again, I hear the conversations, but that is essentially the Maroons saw themselves as different. And we also have to remember that because the British were playing their divide and rule game, yes. they would, for example, that allow is still being played today. enslave people to escape and come into Maroon communities pretending that they're seeking refuge. And then they would go back and report the Maroon strongholds to the British for them to come and destroy. So by the time you're signing a treaty, you're signing a treaty to protect your community from the British and the British allies, which and the British um, subjects, if you will, which were enslaved people. So they, so the uh, the British were the puppet masters. Yeah. They pit other, they pit enslaved people against Maroons. And then when them sign with Maroons, they pit Maroons against enslaved people. And so that for me is an important context that needs to be understood. And, and I also finally want to say that even after the treaties, and yes, the Maroons did help to put down rebellions, but, the, but even in the British documents themselves, in, uh, in London, um, you know, uh, at the British National Archives and in Jamaica, you see the British complaining that the Maroons were still accepting enslaved people and not turning them over. So both things are true at the same time. Yes. Now, this treaty that we're talking about in 1738 um, yes. um, between the British and the Maroons, it sounds mm -hmm. like the Maroons were able, because they withdrew themselves from the direct impact of the British, yeah. were able to go back to their basic way of life that they came from Africa with. And also to team up with the locals that were there before them and live a, a, a very um, um, original form of life. And so we're able to create their own, um, you know, uh, districts and, and, and township. Now, what the implication of this treaty is being referred to today by many as the basis on which moves being made by the political climate in Jamaica should not take place. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you're not here to be a politician. You're here to help us understand. The wording of the treaty, and I, I've also read a letter, of, I think at the time it was the British representative, the Crown representative mm -hmm. to Jamaica, who wrote on his perspective of how he thought the Maroons should be treated. And that letter is very prominent on the pages of the, the Maroons and where, where you can find information of the Maroons. Is this treaty a defining treaty in terms of how the existence of the Maroons and their townships should be treated today? Well, let, let me say, I, I know um, there are various opinions about that and I can only state mine. Right. And other people will tell you something different. I actually do not start with the treaty. Okay. Because, because the treaty uh, did not grant the Maroons freedom. What the treaty dis, did, you know, if you study international relations, for example, um, let's say you have a country, right? You have a country and that country is gaining independence or something like that. 
usually another foreign power has to acknowledge that we recognize that this country is is yes. I, I don't want is sovereign or independent yeah. or mm -hmm. autonomous or whatever you want to use. So the Maroons, as I was saying before, really from the 16th century throughout the 17th and 18th century were already free and had our own territories again because our, our the group the Maroons were formed again by the indigenous Tainos and then Africans who made up the majority of the numbers. So we already had our free territories up in the mountains. What the treaty did was to acknowledge that, all right, we acknowledge that you exist, right? And we are gonna quote unquote, give you these lands. And, and by the way, the, the Mar the, and I really have to say this, even though we talk about the treaty, the treaty actually, although it, 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 it provided for peace, you know, there are still skirmishes and, but the Maroons lost a lot with the treaty because the, the, even the land, the, 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 the lands out west that um, Kojo and his people got were reduced to 1,500 acres. Yes, I saw that. And, and out in, that. Um, in, um, uh, um, in Portland, Portland, 500 yeah. acres, right? And so what I'm saying is that the, we, the Maroon people had a lot more land than that, but the, but the British said 1,500 acres. And then, of course, if the Maroons wanted to sell their what, whatever they hunted, like if they hunted wild hog or something, they had to get a permit from a magistrate or a British official to sell in the markets in the towns. So, so they, so what I'm saying is that the treaty also restricted, put a lot of restrictions and a lot of controls on the Maroons while it still recognized their independence. The two things, two things can be true at the same time, and that is what, what that is. So the Maroons were already free. The treaty acknowledged that freedom. And over the ensuing decades, the British, on several occasions, tried to unilaterally repeal the treaty and to say that we don't need the Maroons anymore, essentially. I'm paraphrasing. We're just going to treat them like other Jamaicans. But the Maroons never saw it that way. Because if you and I enter in, into an agreement, you might decide that you want to back out, but I didn't agree to that. And so as far as the Maroons are concerned, that treaty is still valid today. Now, of course, some of the clauses are not relevant anymore because times have changed, but the treaty is still valid today. Um, and, um, and so, even though the Jamaican constitution and the independence of the island of Jamaica in 1962 yes. didn't specifically address the status of the Maroons, the Maroons still maintain that uh, the, everything still remains intact with respect to, we are a people, we have a, a unique identity, we speak a, a unique language, we have our territories. We, the Maroons are the only group of Jamaicans that I know of that elect a traditional leader. We have our colonels, which are chiefs. No other Jamaican group, as far as I know, elect their own traditional leader. And I'm not talking about political leaders or no, any other type of leader. Not state. And so the, the other thing I want to say is that international law treats the Maroons as either and or indigenous, and or tribal peoples. And Jamaica signed on to, for example, the, the, the United Nations, um, you know, um, human rights, you know, acts and all that stuff, the inter-American, um, you know, all of these human rights, these international bodies that Jamaica has signed on to, that they will respect the right of indigenous or tribal peoples. Um, they've signed on to it. Jamaica, um, applied for and received the status of a UNESCO World Heritage Site for the Blue and John Crow Mountains National Park. And in that application, and I have the application, it is over 2,000 pages, the two reasons why Jamaica got the World Heritage Site status for the Blue and John Crow Mountains National Park is because of the Maroons, specifically Queen Nanny, and because of the nature up there. 
And it's the Maroons who preserve the nature for hundreds of years. So Jamaica has already acknowledged that the Maroons have a particular place within the context of Jamaican history. And I think that the discussion now, it kind of got into a war of words and stuff like yes, that. But ultimately, yes. what we're saying is that in the same way that the United States of America has Native American people, and yes, the United States of America is a sovereign independent country, but sovereign independent countries like the United States or Canada with its First Nation peoples or Ghana with the, with the Ashanti kingdom or New Zealand with the Maori Australia. or Australia with the Aborigines or whatever, sovereign independent countries still are bound by national and international laws to respect individual and group rights. Whether those group rights are religious rights or the rights of First Nation, indigenous, tribal peoples, they are bound by that. So this rhetoric in the media about it's either Jamaica is an independent sovereign country or the Maroons are independent so sovereign. No, the Maroons are Jamaicans. And I can show you my Jamaican passport. I still have it. Right. We're Jamaicans, but we're all, we also have a unique, if I may use that word. And it, it, unique doesn't mean more or less. It's just, again, we, I have already outlined. Specific to your group. Yeah. To the group. And so... I think that where the discussion needs to go in Jamaica, it, I think probably is a formalization through um, a constitution, constitutional reform of the status of Maroon people within Jamaica. The Maroons, we are pro-Jamaicans and we're pro-Maroons. Final thing I'll say is that I think too often people, the debate is, is, is either black and white. You, you're either or you're you are, you're either this or that. Identity is, is layered. So if you're in the United States, for example, and you are African-American, you're African-American, you're an American, so that's two layers of identity. And let's say you're from the South, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, you can also identify as a Southern person. And you might be of a religious group, Christian, Muslim, you might say that I'm also Christian or Muslim or whatever. So that's mm -hmm. four Native American. Or, so that's four. In Jamaica, you can, we're all Jamaicans, that's one. You can be a Maroon, that's two. And you have Maroons who are Christians or you have Maroons who are Rastas. We have multiple layers of identity and it, there is no conflict with, among them. Okay. Wow, 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 wow. Well said and uh, very eye-opening, yeah. very eye-opening, yeah. um, uh, Dr. Fuller. Yes. I, I truly appreciate this. The, 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 the perception now from my per angle is that I can literally watch what's unfolding and have a perspective. And like you say, it doesn't mean you're for or against something. And that's why I wanted to learn. If, um, if you have a little piece of our island that was preserved and protected by a people that because of their history and the, the way they had to live and survive were able to do that, it sounds like a national prize, like a national possession, something that you wouldn't want to mess with. And at the same time, we're hearing the economical benefits of mining mm -hmm. in these areas and all that. But everything is at a price. And I believe when you look at history that the, the information presented, and if you really take the time to understand it, should be a big part of the decision you make. And so this, I'm sure, will help us tonight to understand as we see history unfold. Because you know what? We're still in an atmosphere of division and rule. And also, we're still in an atmosphere where it's almost like history repeats itself. When you're a, when you're a, a people that had to fight from day one, you never stop fighting, it seems. And you look at black people in America, you look at minority here. We're still trying to pass voting rights, voting rights laws. You think that was the 60s, but Americans, black Americans are still waiting and hoping that we can still today 
pass voting right laws because there's stuff happening that's continuing the fight that led to the first passing of voting rights. And so it feels like that fight is never over. And I look at the Maroons in that context and with the information I got tonight, it sounds like history repeating itself in a different form in terms of what is being desired in that part of the world. So I really thank you. And if there's anything else you'd like to share, we have about three minutes, <laughs> Dr. Fuller. And um, again, man, I cannot thank you enough for what you've shared. Invaluable. And the comments speak for themselves. I am so informed after this, says Maxine. This is phenomenal information. Wayne Duarica. Hi, Wayne. Thank you for joining. Wayne says, wow, first time on this show. The information is powerful. I was invited to hear the financial program and I elected to stay on. I am glad that I did. So there we have it, Dr. Fuller. Anything all right. in closing? Yeah, I'll just say I encourage all Jamaicans to, if you have not never been to a Maroon community, visit. And that's one of the things. Sometimes you you need to meet people and see where meet them where they are to understand. When you go up to a Kompong or Charlestown in Portland or Scotts Hall in St. Mary or to the Morton area in the Rio Grande Valley in Portland. Um, the, the Blue and Jonker Mountains uh, are phenomenal. It's where Queen Nanny, uh, Jamaica's only female national heroine is buried. Go up there, see how the Maroons have preserved the area. In the, in the Rio Grande Valley, um, I'm told that there's over 50 waterfalls. Uh, pristine wow. rivers, right? The, the Maroon communities are the lungs of Jamaica. Because how can we do this? Rate. How can we do this, Dr. Fuller? I mean, how, how, what's the channel through which I go to Jamaica, I'm lost. How yeah. do I go toward the Maroon villages? Well, okay. If you know you can, if you fly into Mobile or even if you're in Kingston, I've heard, uh, you know, um, Maroon leaders say you can go and visit a compound. Um, the Charlestown Maroons, they are in Buff Bay. Once you go to Buff Bay um, at the gas station, you turn right and you go up there. Uh, in Moortown, you you know you you can find your way to Moortown. Um, okay. You know my family, as a way of preserving our way of life, we have also started uh, an enterprise there to invite people there, and it's called Cutterwood Village. Okay. And, yes, and as well, so you can visit that. It's K A T A W U D Village dot com. Um, to visit um, in the uh, Rio Grande Valley uh, in Portland. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. What a great night of information. Dr. Fuller, thank you. Thank I, you. I will close with the Maroon Dea. Winogana. No. I was going to tell you, play that song. You see, I read my mind. <laughs> Win. Away. Big up to um, all Jamaicans, all people all over the world. Much love. Happy Black um, um, History Month. Please check out the Smithsonian um, show at um, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's called 1,000 Years of Slavery, um, The Hidden Story. And I'm a historical consultant and a commentator for it. Uh, please check it out. One love to everyone. Um, and um, I'll say one love, peace, and big up. Thank you. Likewise, right back at you, sir. We appreciate you. And like I said, Janice O'Shea says, thanks for presenting, Professor Fuller. Happy Black History Month, Wayne and audience, meeting people where they are, to quote tonight's guest. Lorna Beck says, when you interact with Healthy Lifestyle Network, you will visit Queen Nanny in Moortown. <laughs> Sharon Mitchell Barnwell says, greetings, Dr. Fuller. Wow. Less okay. Up. Thank you all so much for listening. It's good to keep an audience with this type of show. Uh, I know we love our music. We like to dance and be entertained, but boy, nothing beats knowledge. And so I really appreciate everyone who has stuck through this show tonight. And Dr. Fuller, words can't express my gratitude. Thank you, sir. Have a great evening. Likewise. Bless up. Gano saying, Gano.